Hi, I'm Dustin. I'm not one for formal introductions or a resume or list of bona fides. So instead, let's just jump into a vacation style presentation on Iceland, the land of fire and, well, lots of ice with some beautiful landscapes and maybe a little sprinkling of actual geology thrown in for good measure. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the Mid-Atlantic Spreading Center, which Iceland happens to sit right atop. The Gelindenlar eruption during the day, uh, a little quick time lapse on nights in Iceland. We're going to go back to the volcano about a week and a half later when it's becoming more active and we have better uh, contrast at night. Talk about getting around Iceland, some of the challenges. Well worth it though if you can rent a car and don't mind uh, driving back roads hundreds of miles potentially from other people. The Blue Lagoon and the power station which supplies 20,000 homes in Iceland with power and the water for the lagoon itself and some hydrogen uh, as well. The Silfra snorkeling pond and rift valley uh, which is within the Pingvalir National Park. Uh, lots of waterfalls and geysers and thermal vents and then we're gonna go back to the volcano theme and go look at some remnants of lava tubes columnar basalts, stuff like that. And finally, we'll talk about uh, the shrinking glaciers and the effect that that's having on tourism and other things uh, as brought about by anthropogenic climate change. Our journey begins here at the Los Angeles airport. We're going to be flying to JFK and then on to Reykjavik. Total flight time is about 12 hours, not including the layover. Well, I'll see you on the other side. Uh, we chose to travel to Iceland both due to the Gildalinar volcano, which has been erupting since March 19th, and due to the fact that they have had coronavirus restrictions lifted for all of those who have received a full vaccination. started at the hotel in Reykjavik and worked our way south and east counterclockwise across the entire island's perimeter. Uh, note that the primary roads outside of Reykjavik are all mixtures of asphalt, dirt, and gravel, but the only main reliable roads outside of some of the larger towns you can travel is this ring road that follows the entire coastline around the island. Traffic laws are similar to the United States uh, with the exception that uh, you cannot turn right on a red light. But there are a few additional challenges, again like quick transitions from paved to gravel or dirt roads with zero notice until you're cruising along at 90 kilometers an hour only to get dumped out onto uh, a gravel I guess you could call it road. Uh, the other issue is uh, one-way bridges and tunnels uh, where the driver that arrives there first has a right of way. Everyone else has to back up and pull out of the way. This is uh, somewhat similar to the way it's done in New Zealand as well, if you've ever been. The Gal Dingdaler eruption is part of the larger shield volcanic complex that is called the Fjallgistar. This is the first eruption that has occurred uh, in this part of the country in almost 900 years. 
So prior to the actual eruption, they had seen an increase in seismicity in this area beginning in late 2019 all the way up until just before the eruption. And there had been warnings given that an eruption could come at any time. Okay, let's look at the larger tectonic picture of what's going on here near our volcano. So here we are over Iceland. You can see the main Atlantic spreading center running all the way through. And notice this is the only place on it where we see any surface expression that gets above water level. Here we see it coming in from the south, trending up through the Reykjans Peninsula and up through Iceland, making kind of a jog and a triple junction. Here's a simplified diagram uh, of what's going on here at the spreading center. Again, note that it forks off here. We've got the North American plate moving this way, the Eurasian plate moving the other way, and all sorts of tectonics, earthquakes, volcanology, all kinds of stuff going right there in that new lithosphere. So let's take a look at uh, what this looks like in a little more detailed scale. As we can see here, there's really a whole region where we have different active tectonics. Uh, we have different miniature spreading valleys. And here we can see what's going on uh, below the surface where we have thinning in the lithosphere. We have deep asthenospheric upwelling going on, and that's why we're getting all of this volcanism. Prior to the eruption, there were 40,000 seismic events. Here is a graph showing those that occurred from November up until the eruption. Some of these actually were upwards of 5.4 magnitude, so non-trivial stuff. And here is a graph of a swarm of earthquakes that occurred in the seven days prior to the eruption. The local equivalent of the USGS was able to give out warnings and everything else that uh, an eruption may be imminent. In the eruption, there were 40,000 recordable seismic events uh, in the area. This is the trail uh, walk up. It's not particularly difficult, but it does give a decent incline as you get closer to the actual volcano itself. It's about an hour and 15 minutes in and about 45 minutes back out. This is a photo that was taken just as the fissure started to open up. There was a single opening that began to fill the valley with lava. And then over subsequent weeks, there have been multiple vents with various levels of activity. However, the primary one that you'll see in all of the videos known as Vent System 1 is still the one that has the big classic cone that's built up and is uh, contributing the most uh, lava to the area. However, uh, vents 3, 2, and 5 have also started to have some level of surface expression building up that cone, and they may take some of the volume of lava away from vent system 1, and they have started to increase in the uh, volume of lava that's flowing out of them. Okay, so here's a diagram that shows that first vent and all the subsequent vents and shows some of the development of the cinder cones. Uh, 
that have already occurred as of April 14th. The energy of each of these seems to shift over time. At the time we were there, Vent 1 was the primary eruption, and you could see a small bit of gas and other things escaping from Vent 5. Okay, so there's a small raised sort of peninsula that you walk up as you get right up to the eruption. And you're surrounded on either side by the solidified lava flows, which, as you can see, you can walk right up to. Uh, one thing I didn't realize when I first saw this was that they're solidified at the top. But if you look at them from the side, you can actually see that there is a red hot magma layer that still flows underneath what's here and even the surface all the way through is extremely hot as you can see here as I pour some water onto it while we were there they were people roasting marshmallows hot dogs all sorts of things on top of it hot dogs are of course a good choice because in Iceland they don't use a lot of beef in their hot dogs they actually use lamb and it's considered a, a regional Reykjavik delicacy their street stalls and everywhere else that sell them. I forgot my infrared thermometer, but in case you had any questions as to how hot this is, even at this surface skin that's solidified, uh, here's a good test for you. Well, it's erupting at 1400 degrees, but here a quarter mile away, it's still hot enough to flash water to steam instantaneously. Okay, as we continue to walk up closer to the primary vent, we come to an area where the lava is actively flowing and actually expanding out into the valley. And here at the noise and everything is really strong and you see the surface solidifying instantaneously and then being immediately broken up and pushed onto new ground as this thing progresses outward. So you can hear the unique glass breaking sound it gets pretty darn loud when you're up close Okay, so here's the main event, so to speak, is you crest over a little bit of a blind hill. You come face-to-face uh, -face with the volcano here. We visited this uh, about 7 a.m. on May 8th, and then again from around 11 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. on the 22nd. So we'll start with the May 8th videos. Okay, here's the obligatory selfie with the volcano shot. 
uh, you really can hear this thing roaring, uh, even when it's, you're not having the active eruptions, although you can hear distinct change in pitch and everything when it actually starts to really get after it, which on the 8th was about every 10 minutes you'd get a fairly minor eruption, and then when we came back on the 22nd, you'd get larger eruptions every 12 to 15 minutes. So while we were sitting watching the uh, minor eruptions, here you can see the secondary vent uh, putting out a little bit of smoke there to the left. And then this popped up, which appears to be a dust devil uh, if you live in the desert, but brought in by some sort of convective forces going on here uh, with the lava itself. In fact, uh, in some of this, you actually see it go out onto the lava and actually pick pieces up and throw them around. Look at the Didn't rock. catch it all on video, but there were some cases where stuff was getting thrown. That's red so hot cool. lava pieces yeah, 20, 30 feet into the air. So this, of course, would be the optimal time in these terrible weather conditions to try to throw up a drone. So you only live once, so uh, let's go ahead and do that. So here's where we're seeing the majority of the lava filling out uh, this little valley here on top of the hillside. Uh, in fact, this is the arm that kind of fingered out and later uh, in the week they decided to build a earthen berm around everything. And it held for a couple of days and then actually got the rock got melted right through. And there was a brief time where you could actually see lava cascading like a waterfall down the hillside, which was pretty impressive. I believe they intend to set up yet another berm to try to keep all the lava here uh, and off of all the main roads throughout the area. Okay, here's our approach to try to come right up to the cone itself. I um, was having a little bit of issues with the heat drafts and few hiccups with the gimbal on the drone just because these are far from ideal flight conditions with the winds that we're seeing the weird dust devils and of course the immense heat i'm, I'm really surprised that uh drone made it through uh this entire trip uh kind of assumed this would be a sacrificial lamb sort of situation but it uh, held up fine and this is the least expensive drone that i own so this shows that uh not only are these things affordable and relatively easy to fly, you can actually do some pretty impressive things with them. I actually use what equates to about a $400 drone you can buy at uh, Walmart to do uh, orthomosaics, uh, mapping with uh, some elevation, digital elevation models that are coming out of it, and uh, a lot of stuff you would never think would be possible uh, at this price point. Okay, while this footage was undoubtedly impressive, I think it'd be much, much cooler to see it with a greater contrast at night. 
The only problem is during the spring and parts of summer in Iceland, it's really only quote unquote dark about three hours a night. And even then it never gets truly dark. You can still go outside and go to the bar if you want at two o'clock in the morning and still be able to uh, stumble home safely. So while we're watching this time lapse of it getting dark from the hotel room, let's take a look at doing some homework and what's actually going on here geologically. Uh, let's remember that this is a shield volcano, meaning it has a broad sort of wide shape. And that's dictated primarily by the viscosity of the magma itself. Uh, depending on the viscosity, you, which of course is the resistance to flow, you can have violent eruptions with ejecta going thousands of feet in the air. You can have everything down to just minor leakages through, feech, through fissures, or you can have here where you have primarily low energy eruptions, but you do get the building of a little bit of a cinder cone and some mild eruptions that are actually ideal conditions because scientists can actually get up onto these, whereas with the more what we think of as you know, violent eruptions, you're not able to get close just due to safety concerns. So here's a classic uh, pictorial of a shield volcano. Notice we do have our small fountain. Uh, there actually is a, a bit of a gas cloud. They're talking about having increased sulfur dioxide levels that are kind of falling in as a haze over Reykjavik. Uh, and you actually are getting a bit of tephra uh, ejection. Uh, we walked around picking up pieces of volcanic glass or tephra within about uh, four or five hundred yards of the volcano itself. But we did see some all the way out in the parking lot. So it is getting ejected at least a mile. We see two distinct uh, lava flows kind of fingering out away from the volcano. We're seeing these flow fields where it's damming up against the topography. And potentially, as we're not very far from the beach, we may actually see these ocean entries where we get these quote-unquote littoral explosions and I think pillow basalts and all kinds of stuff there. There is evidence that there was a lava tube forming underneath the uh, flow. Uh, it actually collapsed, and that's part of what they think happened with the secondary containment that failed, is that there was a lava tube forming underneath it, and it actually partially, the, the, the ceiling collapsed, and they actually saw a uh, relief cause there, and then it started cascading down the mountain. Okay, so here we are back at the volcano on the 22nd at around 1 a.m. But before we get too far into the really cool clip here, uh, let's continue on our uh, geology lesson a little bit. Typically speaking, when you're in a spreading center like we have here between the North American and Eurasian plates, you get new lithosphere being created, but you typically don't get any any landmass that builds above sea level. Iceland's a really unique case. In fact, the case is named after it in what they call the Icelandic hotspot, where you're having both a spreading region and you're directly below a mantle plume, which in fact they call the Icelandic mantle plume, where you're having spreading and volcanism and everything associated with that coming near the surface and then it's magnified by the fact that you're sitting on top of this hot spot where you're getting deep welling from within the asthenosphere causing a unique combination of conditions where you're actually able to build out significant uh, topographic relief above sea level.
So just up the road from the volcano, in fact, you can see it from the volcano, is Iceland's largest geothermal plant. Uh, it was built in 1976, and it supplies the entire southwestern region with power. It supplies 21,000 houses with electrical and uh, hot water for heating. There aren't many electric heaters uh, in homes or businesses. Hot water is actually piped into town, and everything's done with big radiators either in the floor or in the walls. As a result of this, power is ridiculously cheap uh, on the order of uh, 11 cents a kilowatt. And hot water is essentially free, which is why nearly every home, hotel, resort, anything you can think of usually has some kind of hot tub associated with it. Highway. This one can be a little confusing. There are signs for a high-end hoity-toity resort and for a, an industrial power plant. And both are next to each other and are intertwined. The effluent water, wastewater from the power plant is sent over to the fancy lagoon where People bathe in it. It has a really high silica content and has all sorts of supposed healing properties. There's a white clay that basically only occurs here. Hydrogen car fueling stations have started to appear in parts of Iceland. And the hydrogen is generated by the excess power coming out of the power plant during off-peak hours. There's an electrolysis plant that actually takes some of the affluent water, applies an electrical current, and generates hydrogen that they can then compress and use as a vehicle fuel. Iceland has been expanding its geothermal power generation as they have been phasing out gasoline-powered cars. Uh, they are up to 45% of all new vehicle registrations being of EVs with an intent to go to nearly 100% in the next decade. Even these small cabins are tied into this uh, hot water system. And as you can see, all of them even have hot tubs. Okay, let's, let's continue on. Uh, this is another interesting stop. This is the Silfra Snorkeling Pond within the build as the only place in the world where you can readily snorkel between two tectonic plates. There's a fissure between the two. That would be the North American and Eurasian plate. And for about 80 US dollars, they will put you in a dry suit and you can go down this big fissure. And the outside temperature was about 33, 34 degrees this morning. So this deeper portion here with the sheer walls is called the Cathedral. Continue uh, along the uh, fissure here. 
which eventually opens into a shallow lagoon. Okay, so here we are at the Silphurus snorkeling pond again uh, with that uh, fissure that we went down in and then that one that we flew the drone over. So here's a little context of what we're looking at on Google Earth. And then here's a pictorial of the area explaining what's going on. So we're looking at a continental rift valley that's formed here. Notice actually matches the standard diagram for these pretty close. You've got the North American and Eurasian plates pulling apart from one another, and we have this valley that has these downthrown blocks. And we have all of these great big huge fissures at the surface uh, running along the valley, which are pretty impressive to look at. And of course the fissures extend down uh, below water level in the little pond in the bay there. So what's re not readily apparent when you look at these, of course, is that these quote-unquote fissures, as people were calling them locally, are actually the exposed foot wall block due to the normal faulting that's occurring here. We're going to continue on here a little further off the beaten path. Note that the weather does change quickly. Uh, the skies are relatively clear, and here it is uh, snowing on us just a few minutes later. Yeah, I'm going to combine a few examples here. Iceland is the land of fire and ice, and uh, in addition to that, there's a whole lot of waterfalls, caves, cliffs, stuff like that, uh, that I'll just sprinkle in here a little bit. Here's a map of just the uh, most prolific waterfalls. Uh, in fact, there are thousands within the country. Ooh, that was a close one. So yeah, I must contend that Iceland probably has the highest uh, concentrations uh, per square mile of uh, waterfalls. Uh, notice this one has some cool columnar basalts going on. Those are also very common here at a lot of stops. Got that J.J. Uh, Abrams uh, natural lens flare going on here. So we'll just uh, run through a couple of these. I'm not going to say much. We'll just uh, just watch. So 95% of Iceland's municipal water supply actually comes from boreholes and other means and is completely unfiltered. They don't put chlorine in their water. Everything is just produced and immediately put in for municipal use. No filtering or processing is required. Rural homes either pull their water from one of these surface running water supplies or drill shallow wells uh, for their sources. In 
some areas the water has a bit of a sulfur smell to it. Uh, for the most part, the TDS is really low. However, there were a few places that had uh, mineral water. In fact, here's an example uh, of a farm that uh, allowed people to come right up and uh, sample their own mineral water uh, right there from their shallow wells. Now here's an example that shows uh, a mineral spring uh, out here in the middle of nowhere that a farmer uh, lets a tourist use. You can see on the right that the uh, drinking water that is found in most of the country has very low total dissolved solids. But uh, here you can see you've got some water that has quite a bit of calcium, a little sodium, magnesium, and iron, and a lot of CO2 and HCO3 given a lightly carbonated effect and an alkaline pH similar to what you'd pay a fortune for at your local Whole Paycheck, a.k.a. Whole Foods. And here you can just drive right up, open the tap, fill up your water bottle. Here you can see some of that CO2 bubbling through and some discoloration from the iron and other dissolved solids. Let's take ourselves a little sample here. Oh boy, that is refreshing. Okay, uh, get back to looking at just how widespread the geothermal and volcanic area is through here. Uh, this map shows all of the areas which have strong recent volcanism. Although, again, you run into geothermal hot springs in areas where they're, they've drilled real shallow to harness geothermal energy throughout the island. Uh, here we are at the uh, Stroker Geyser in Hot Springs, which erupts again about every 8 to 12 minutes, kind of like Old Faithful. vents that are going off uh, constantly with uh, steam flashing off and coming to the surface. You can see all of the sulfur buildup uh, around it. And of course it smells like sulfur. Okay, now we're going to head to the Vachlanir Cave. This is actually a lava tube that subsided on one side, causing the supply of lava to be cut off, and the rest of the lava was able to drain out. So we're left with this big open four-chambered subterranean cave. And I'm going to go ahead and let our tour guide take over for the duration of this. Well, uh, we are standing here. This staircase here is seven and a half meter. You start going down here. This is the surface tube over there, where the farmers pick up the water. We go down here, we go, we go into this chamber here, to that direction. After a few minutes there, we will go through the breakdown. This is the breakdown of the cave. And we will go towards the parking area, not all the way. We have another staircase which is 12 meters deep, go down that one and a little bit east from there. So one, two, three, four, or as I look at it, one, two, and three pitch. Okay. You can turn your lights on, follow me. Alright. Would be one, I mean like one, two, three flow. You'd the tube would flow over. Mm -hmm.
These lava tubes are present throughout Iceland and are often found when somebody falls through into one. Well, if it wasn't for this opening, no one had knew about this cave. And it was 8,000 years ago when this opened up. When we start this process, 2009, the National Park and the, the volunteers around here, and, um, there was a mountain of mud. There was about 80 tons of mud which was taken and hung, digged up, uh, lifted up in this container. So here our host just describes that they cleaned all this out and we moved down to our next point of interest. It's interesting to note that the volcano that's going on now has actually had some of these lava tubes that have been identified and one actually collapsed and was a conduit for lava that actually went and undermined the berm of secondary containment, allowed the lava to spill out below uh, where they had actually cordoned things off just a couple of days into our trip. And uh, inside here, and uh, I'm going a little further. Don't come closer. No, stay further out, please. I will explain later why. I wait for everyone to come to the side, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about this lava forming the cave, forming of the cave. As you can see, this is a big chamber we are in. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you can say, the highest part of this cave. And uh, up there are the craters to that direction. One of the river, just one, came flowing from, the, from there, all the way down forming this cave. But as you can see now, this is low. And the reason for that is the heat in here. The heat was over 1,000 degrees centigrade, uh, and the ceiling of the cave couldn't stand the heat and sank towards the floor, close to two. Most of the uh, most of the lava empties out, except this lava lake, and you see the light gray level goes up to three meters. That's the last lava in here. Uh, there might still be cave a few meters away. It might have collapsed all the way. We don't know. There's no entrance. But underneath here is another cave. And that's the reason I don't want you all to come here. Because if I fell through, I don't want you to fall. It might hurt for me. But this is more or less like a cheese. We have this big cave here. We have one underneath. There's most likely another cave or the same cave going up there. And there might be caves to the side as well. And this, uh, yeah, this looks like a... Uh, we have a lot of caves around, and uh, it definitely is. If you are hiking around in the lava field, you have to be extra careful. You might be the lucky one finding a cave, but I'm not sure if you can tell anyone about it. Hmm. You know, I found the cave. And uh, through the centuries, like I would say through decades, maybe, uh, through the centuries, we have lost people in Iceland that we found. In lava field like this one. And when we have been uh, uh, searching around here for the caves, checking for new caves and so on, we sometimes can see a little blue sky, a uh, little hole on the, on the ceiling. So uh, that means that you can go the other way. You can go from there and down, of course. Uh, after everything stopped, this lava flowing or the eruption, this start cooling down. You know how long time it takes to cool down? Anyone? Hundreds of years. This one, no. This one can take up to 100 years. It probably 70 to 100 years, like like lava field like this. Uh, 2014, there was an eruption in uh, 300 kilometers east from here, in the middle of Iceland. It lasts for six months. It's going to take that one at least 200 years two centuries because of the thickness and the size of it. It was a huge one. And uh, what is going on now, we never know. We never know how it ends, how it builds up. It, it will probably be a, quite, a, quite a big one.
Okay, so this is the Glacial Lagoon, which is uh, right next to the famous Diamond Beach. So here, large chunks of ice fall off of the glacier, float around in this lagoon. And some of them are almost clear, uh, really visually impressive. And then eventually actually wash out with the, the tide and get pushed up onto the beach giving the appearance of large diamonds that have washed up upon an all-black beach. This really is visually impressive. Uh, truly, Iceland is the land of fire and ice with volcanism to the west and amazing glacials and everything everywhere else. So here, whoa, look, you could just see a piece just uh, broke off right there. These are now, absolutely after beautiful. Seeing what I now think let's is go see how they the look when you wash part up on of the Iceland, beach. Uh, the Glacial Lagoon and Diamond Beach. We have to get into the uh, depressing bit. Anthropogenic climate change has caused these glaciers to recede at a increased rate uh, since the 19th century, which has affected the, not only the environment, but also travel and tourism throughout the area. Ski resorts are open fewer and fewer months of the year. I talked to several locals that were concerned that the season in which they're able to do glacial tours and other things related to uh, the glaciers has been reduced significantly and their revenue has reduced accordingly. So just kind of a somber thing to go out on. But remember that there are parts of the world that are going to suffer much, much, much stronger and poignant direct effects of climate change. Luckily, Iceland uh, is a first world country and can afford to do a lot of mitigation. This is not going to be true of some of the more economically challenged parts of the world. Like any interest you may see on a trip to Iceland, I hope everyone gets a chance to go and see it for themselves. If you have any questions or you want any of the stock footage, please let me know. Uh, I, if you have anything else interesting that you'd like a uh, drone survey or anything else done, I'll do that for free. I just really like being able to go out and capture this breathtaking stuff and stay in practice. Thank you for your time.